So I will be speaking against the proposed pro proposition of the affirmative in which we put the ban on women in combat. Um, first, I would like to point out that women are inherently are not inherently excluded from various combat situations, but only when there's actual fighting um, inherent in the position. They are able to provide supporting roles, such as medics and other positions. Um, secondly, the affirmative claim that the rule should be repealed because women are trained for combat. This is true, but the extent of the training must be taken into account. For instance, standards are lowered for women due to their physical constraints that is biological and not due to their lack of training. The Department of the Army addressed this in their Physical Readiness Training Manual in 1992, in which they said, women must be treated differently from males. Although they can still achieve high physical performance, gender differences can be alleviated when exercise is conducted by ability groups, but when unit runs are conducted, the gender differences cannot be ignored. Also, the skills training is quite different from that of men due to roles enacted by the military, hoping to keep women in an environment in which they feel secure. In the book, Women in Combat, Civic Duty, or Military Liability, which was published in 2001, the author of the Young and Center found that officially the closest physical contact the army can have, that army men can have with women is body touching during non-violent physical exercise or to pin on the war. This will not be beneficial when soldiers are supposed to be wrestling, performing bayonet, bayonet attacks and chokeholds, simulating strangulation, body tackles, and other various close contact training. Furthermore, in terms of cultural or societal training, women are not properly trained like men. In the documentary, documentary Tough Guys, spelled G-U-I-S-G, -G, leading media activist Jackson Katz says that what the media do is help to construct violent masculinity as a cultural norm. Therefore, the media trains men to be rough and tough, whereas we look for the media for women and they, we are taught to be soft and frail. Next, the affirmative claims that the exclusion rule violates the American value of equality. First, I would like to point out, as I said, that women are not being totally ignored in the military. In 2007, the National Defense Research Institute stated that we've sent seven so soldiers at a time to patrol the base for force protection as perimeter guards. That included women. There were also female medics there on the medical teams, and there were female signal leaders who provided general support to the brigade and provided connectivity. Secondly, the affirmative claims that the rule prevents women from taking positions that men can take. In reality, it is the attitudes of people in the military, not the rule itself, that hurts women's equality status more. The Pentagon released sexual harassment data in 2008 that showed that one third of women in the military were sexually harassed. This is only this is only a limited number due to the limited contact women have with men, as they are not in combat situations. Clearly, there is a lack of respect shown in the attitudes of many of these military men, and if the rule was lifted, they would most likely be. Um, there would most likely be higher statistics. Finally, the biggest issue that the affirmative brought up was the idea that um, the Army is, with its rule, is um, violating the idea of equality. But we have to think that Army, if the Army is about functionality, not about equality. They're there to protect us. Women's presence in combat will compromise the secrecy of the mission. For instance, in the book by Fenner and Young I mentioned earlier from 2001, this is the account of a POW who broke the rules when she was interrogated. In Cornham's first Iraqi interrogation as a POW, she admitted her chopper was shot down during a search and rescue mission. She instructs her reader that the Iraqi guards were less rough with her after her admission, which she admitted was a violation of the soldier's code of conduct. This could be due to lack of training, psychological weakness, or any other factors. Think of this in contrast with the account of a male from the same book. Captain Anderson, who followed Cadet Cornham into the interrogation room, refused to reveal any information except his name, rank, and serial number, for which he was repeatedly beaten by the Iraqis. The next point they made was that the war today has no front lines and that women in the army are already safe. Danger in multiple levels. Their minor claim is that women are trained for combat situations regardless of their position. Like I said earlier, although they are trained, they do not receive adequate training. Constraints and rules that prevent them from doing so are inherent in this situation right now. Although in training sessions, many women were found to be able to handle cycles, were not found to be able to handle psychological obstacles. In the book by Fenner and Young, they found that real-life examples of women who have been able to withstand even simulated ground combat horrors without being damaged to the point of permanent disability are extremely rare. Their last point was the idea that lifting the rule would strengthen the military's power by providing more qualified persons to fulfill positions. 
The first minor point says that the rule would bring in machine personnel. In terms of personnel, it has been found that there is a finite limit to the proportion of female population that is interested in the military. The affirmative also claims that women's presence in combat will increase the effect of the mission. I have found that the opposite to be true. First, cohesion within the unit will be first. Will be hurt. In an article by Vicki Samons from the School of Advanced Military Studies in 1992, it was found that interdependence is affected by job skill, which is, which I said earlier, is significantly different between men and women due to the combat training. Ta tactical skills, strength, this is a biological difference. Stamina, also a biological difference. And aggression, which is mediated by the media itself. And protectionism, which I will address later. Um, finally, women would compromise decision-making strategies of men in fields, which would hurt the effectiveness of the mission. In the book by Linda Frank I mentioned earlier, Lieutenant Colonel William Bryan was quoted as saying, I am not prepared to see American mothers and daughters paraded down the streets of Baghdad and subjected to abuse, when it's not necessary. Now those are my values as, Amer as an American citizen. Another account found in the Presidential Commission Report in 1997 said that the mistreatment of women taken as POWs could have a negative impact on male captives the presence of women might cause additional moral, morale problems for male prisoners. And finally, a personal account of a former Vietnamese POW, Air Force Colonel Norman McDonald, said this, there is no question in my mind that I would certainly lean toward giving the enemy something if I knew they were raising hell with a fellow female prisoner. Based on these points, I hope that you will support our idea to keep the military evidence.